Hello everyone and welcome back to Worked Heat Transfer Examples. Today we'll be working on a heat exchanger problem. Here we have a shell and tube heat exchanger designed to heat 2 kilograms per second of water from 15 degrees Celsius to 85 degrees Celsius. This heating is to be accomplished by passing hot engine oil at 160 degrees through the shell side of the exchanger. The oil is known to provide an average convection coefficient of 400 watts per meter squared Kelvin. 10 tubes pass the water through the shell. Each tube is thin walled with a diameter of 25 millimeters and it makes eight passes through the shell. If the oil leaves at 100 degrees Celsius, what is the flow rate and how long must the tubes be to accomplish the desired heating. A sketch of the problem is given below. We know that cold fluid enters the heat exchanger at a particular temperature and mass flow rate. We know the temperature at the exit of the cold side. We know the temperature at the inlet of the hot side, but not the mass flow rate. We know the temperature at the outlet of the hot side. We're also told the heat transfer coefficient on the hot side of the heat exchanger. We know that there are 10 tubes that pass through this shell and each tube make eight passes through the shell. The tube diameter is given at 25 millimeters. We're asked to find the mass flow rate of the hot oil and the length of the tubes. It's not specified but I'm going to solve for the length of each pass of the tubes. Assumptions we'll make in this problem include steady state, that fluid and material properties are constant, that there are no losses to the surroundings, that the tube is thin walled and has negligible thermal resistance, and that the flow is fully developed in the tube. When I do heat exchanger problems, I look at this two by two matrix. I'm finding the objective, whether I'm sizing the heat exchanger or trying to find the amount of heat transfer. And then I look at the method. Do I want to use log mean temperature difference or effectiveness NTU? In this problem, I'm trying to size the heat exchanger because I want to find the area or the length of each tube pass. Also, because it's not a simple counterflow or parallel flow heat exchanger, I'm going to use the effectiveness NTU method. So here we see that we have a process to solve this problem. Our general process for the effectiveness NTU method when sizing a heat exchanger includes picking the geometry, finding the values of capital C, finding the effectiveness, calculating NTU, and using NTU to find the area. First, we'll pick the geometry. In this problem, we have a shell and tube heat exchanger. There's one shell pass. There's no baffles, so the fluid going through the shell doesn't pass over the tubes multiple times. And there's an even number of tube passes at eight. I can look at table 11.4 and that will give me an expression for NTU as a function of effectiveness. In this case, I'm talking about a shell and tube heat exchanger with one shell pass and an even number of tube passes. I have a correlation for that. It's given here, but it's a function of capital E, and capital E is given here. The next thing that I have to do is find capital C. Remember that capital C is equal to the mass flow rate times the specific heat for each fluid, and then I take the ratio with the minimum value over the maximum value. Unfortunately, I don't know the specific heat for either water or oil, and I don't have the mass flow rate on the hot side of the heat exchanger. So first I'll look up some properties. I can find the average oil temperature and then I convert that to Kelvin. I see it's 403 degrees Kelvin. 
I'm going to say that's about 400 so that I don't have to do linear interpolation. I go to table A.5 and I read off the specific heat as 2,337. Then I can use that to find capital C. I know the specific heat, but I don't know the mass flow rate of the oil. So I'm going to have to leave this one for a minute. Next, I'm going to look for the specific heat of water. I know the average temperature of the water is 50 degrees or 323 degrees Kelvin. I'm going to say that that's about 325 degrees Kelvin. I look it up on the table. I'm going to look up more than just specific heat here because I look at this problem, I see that I don't have a heat transfer coefficient in the tubes, so I feel like I'll probably have to do some internal convection analysis. So I look up several properties, including the specific heat. I use the specific heat to find the fluid heat capacity rate, or capital C, and I see that it's 10,445 watts per Kelvin. Now, I still want to find the mass flow rate of the hot water. So I can see if I look at the whole heat exchanger and I do a first law analysis, I know that all the heat leaving the hot fluid goes into the cold fluid, provided I assume that there are no losses to the external environment. First, I'm going to just try to calculate the total heat. I don't know the mass flow rate on the hot side, so I can't use that, but I know everything on the cold side. So I can see that the heat transferred between the two fluids is equal to m dot cp times delta t on the cold side. I can put some values into my calculator and I find that the total actual heat transfer is 189,350 watts. Now I can use that to find the mass flow rate on the hot side. In this case, I'm actually going to set m dot cp delta t on the hot side equal to the cold side. And then I'll figure out an equation for the mass flow rate on the hot side. I like to set my equation up like this as mass flow rate multiplied by two ratios, one of specific heats and the other of temperature differences. This way, as long as all my units are the same, they'll cancel out. In this case, I'll put numbers into my calculator and I'll find that the mass flow rate on the hot side is 5.2 kilograms per second. Now I know the mass flow rate of the oil, which is one of the things the problem asked me to find. And with the mass flow rate of the oil, I can find the fluid heat capacity rate on the hot side. And in this case, it's 12,152. So now I know the fluid heat capacity rates on the hot and cold sides. I see on the hot side is C max and the cold side is C min. I also find that the ratio of these two parameters is 0.86. The next step in my process is to find the effectiveness. Effectiveness is given by the actual heat transfer divided by the maximum heat transfer. I can use the value for actual heat transfer because I've already calculated it. But in this case, I'm going to set up the effectiveness as the equations shown at the top. In one case, I'm using the fluid heat capacity rate on the cold side as the numerator. And in the other case, I'm using the fluid heat capacity rate on the hot side as the numerator. Both of these equations are correct. But since C min is C on the cold side, I'm going to choose the leftmost equation, boxed here in green, because then my fluid heat capacity rates cancel out. And I'm left with delta T over delta T. And I can find that my effectiveness is 0 0.483. The next thing in my process is to calculate NTU. I've already looked at the geometry of the heat transfer, so I know that I can use this expression to find NTU as a function of CR and effectiveness. Now I'll do a little bit of math. First, I'll calculate capital E. 
and I find that it's 1.73. Then I'll put capital E into the equation on the left, and I find that the number of transfer units is 1. Finally, I'm going to use the number of transfer units to find the area required for heat transfer in my heat exchanger. The definition of NTU is the effective heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area divided by capital C min. I can rearrange this to get an equation for area. Unfortunately, I don't yet know the effective heat transfer coefficient. I only know the heat transfer coefficient on the hot side of the heat exchanger. So here, I'm going to use a thin wall assumption. If I use a thin wall assumption, that means that I'm going to neglect whatever resistance is caused by the wall that separates the hot side and the cold side of the fluid, along with any fouling that may be on the inside or the outside of that wall. I know the heat transfer coefficient on the hot side, but not on the cold side. Unfortunately, this means I'll have to do an internal convection analysis inside the tube. The problem told me to assume fully developed flow, but I'll check to see if that's reasonable or not as I'm doing my analysis. If you want a more detailed internal convection analysis, please see the examples for 3.2 on the MyCourses webpage or on YouTube. Ultimately, first I'm going to find the Reynolds number inside the tube. The Reynolds number is based on the diameter of the tube. And I find that I have turbulent flow inside the tube or that both the thermal and hydrodynamic boundary layers become fully developed after 10 diameters. I'm going to assume that my tube is longer than 10 diameters. That gives me a Nusselt number correlation and a Nusselt number of just under 120. I can then use the definition of the Nusselt number to find the heat transfer coefficient on the cold side of the heat exchanger inside my tubes. In this case, that heat transfer coefficient is 3,058 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Now, I take that heat transfer coefficient along with my known heat transfer coefficient on the hot side of the heat exchanger. I put them in to my equation for effective heat transfer coefficient with a thin wall assumption. And I find that the effective heat transfer coefficient in this problem is 353.7 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Finally, I can use that information to calculate A. I know all of these values and I put them into my calculator and I find that the total heat transfer area required for my heat exchanger is 29.5 meters squared. But that's not what the problem asked me to do, so I'm not done yet. But what the problem is asking me for is the pipe length, which I've taken to mean the length of each pass inside my heat exchanger. I know my total area, and I know that the total area, if I assume that the walls are very thin, is equal to the number of tubes, n, multiplied by the perimeter of each tube, pi d, multiplied by the length of each tube, which is 8 times L, where L is the pass length. Then I can get an equation for L. I know everything in this equation, and I can plug some numbers into my calculator, and I find that L is 4.7 meters. That was a long question, but we did it. Congratulations, everyone, and I'll see you next time on Worked Heat Transfer Examples. Thank you.